championship teams. Hello, I'm Robert Walls. I coached over 347 games of AFL football. Now that's a lot of players. And after each game, I wrote a letter to every one of them. We're catching up with one of those players today. Come and join us. Long, one out, Kernahan. Oh, too easy. Stephen Kernahan is football royalty. Dix, as he's universally known, arrived at Carlton in 1986, touted by many as the most exciting key position prospect in the country. And weren't they good judges? <laughs> Kernahan took the VFL by storm and was appointed captain of the club in just his second season, leading the Blues to the 1987 Premiership in his first year at the helm at the tender age of 23 under the guidance of coach Robert Walls. His star would continue to rise over the next decade as an inspirational, strong-marking key forward who thrived on the responsibility continually heaped on his ample shoulders. Well, we're here in the Carlton locker rooms, and Steve, it's hard to believe that 19 years ago you came across from Adelaide to start your career with the Blues. It is, Warsy. I, um, I thought I'd be over here, wasn't sure if you'd make it. I thought I might be back on the next plane home, but... Uh, Still floating around here a little bit and uh, enjoying it, it's been great. You grew up uh, very much in a sporting family, your, your brothers David and uh, Gary, they were keen sportsmen and of course your father Harry, well uh, he, he was a bit of a legend back there at Glenelg where he played close to 200 games and represented South Australia. What was it like growing up as a kid? Yeah, it was great. Uh, yeah, as I said, Dad made a name for himself over there, he, he's got better as the years have gone on, he tells me. Um, I suppose his great times he rucked against uh, you know, uh, Big Nick and Polly Farmer at the MCG as part of the South Australian side that beat uh, the Vicks for the first time in 63. Um, and it was great, he ran the Glenelg Footy Club where we grew up playing footy as kids together and uh, we all, and mum loved footy as well. And uh, yeah, it was just a footy, footy orientated life and we all loved it and all the, Gary and David loved playing footy and uh, we just grew up playing at Glenelg and went through the uh, junior size together. And, in their age groups and uh, you know, Dad ran the footy club so it was all good. Um, tell us a bit about being a kid in Glenelg. Was there any pressure on you from uh, neighbours and, and your mates and uh, the parents of your mates that your father Harry had been a, a wonderful player for Glenelg and he was managing the club as you grew up? Any pressure on you to perform? <coughs> we had no pressure from Mum and Dad, they were terrific and all they did was ferry us kids around. It was like a you know, normal uh, if you had three sons, uh, you played footy in the winter, cricket in the uh, summer, and also did a lot of life saving. So, mum and dad were at life saving carnivals, cricket in the morning, carnivals on the Sunday, footy, uh, footy season was footy all morning, and we felt no pressure to play and loved doing all that sort of stuff. It was great to grow up doing it. Footy, cricket, and life saving. Now, is it true that you represented South Australia in those three sports as a youngster? Yeah, I did. Um, Hard to imagine you as a lifesaver. It's a bit of a laugh, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> if a few people have seen me swim, it wouldn't be, it's not very pretty. It's a bit like my left foot, it's not very good. And uh, in under 12s, I think that, that year I played in the state cricket side, under 12s, I played in the state footy side, and uh, saw a bit of, you know, got a bit homesick going away in the state doing that sort of stuff, but enjoyed it, and uh, it's good times. And Chris McDermott, who of course was a mate of yours, and he went on to captain the Adelaide Crows when they first started. But when did you and Chris start to knock around together? We knew each other in primary school, but we played state cricket in the under 12s and we travelled to Brisbane together, and I sort of met him through that. And we went to Brighton High School together the next year, which is a local school in, in, you know, just down the road. Became best friends, he's the best man at my wedding, and they're uh, still great mates. As a junior footballer, a lot of people wouldn't know that uh, as a youngster you pretty much played as a, a wingman and a centreman and then between the ages of 14 and 16 you grew about a foot and that's yeah, when you started to play as a key forward. Well just back on Chris McDermott, he, he was about my height I reckon at, at 14 and he was like the big tough bloke playing in the middle and centre half back and, and running games and uh, two years later I was a ruckman centre half forward so I really grew heavily, probably seven or eight inches grew in that time so I was a late bloomer and um, went from a centreman to a ruckman pretty quickly. How old were you when you had your first game for Glenelg Seniors? I started at 17, I was 17 then um, in 81, I played um, in, when I was 16 in 1980, uh, Dad was uh, CEO of the footy club then and uh, he held me back. I played under 17s the first game. I played six games in the under 19s, and I played the rest of the year in the reserves, and, and, and sort of was going okay. And uh, I think Dad held me back. They didn't want me to play at 16. He thought that was too young, and uh, started the next year. So, 
And what about uh, the Magnificent Seven down at the Bay Hotel? Does that bring back memories? Because uh, <laughs> legend has it that you and uh, Chris McDermott, uh, Tony McGuinness, who was another teammate of yours at Glenelg, you used to hold court, King Kernahan holding court at the Bay Hotel every Sunday in Adelaide. Is that true? Very uh, humble, isn't it, of us <laughs> to call us that. But uh, it was meant to be a private one, but it's got out a little bit over the years. But uh, about that time when we were 17, 18, Sunday trading came in around Glenelg, so it was good to uh, get out and, we'd, not pub crawls I would call them, but we used to get out to go to train in the morning and enjoy ourselves. So I don't think I was holding court. I was just trying to keep some of those blokes under control. <laughs> they were a bit, uh, a bit lively at that stage, but it was good. 1983, and uh, you've won the McGarry Medal, but you haven't won the McGarry Medal. Uh, 44 votes, an amazing total of votes to get. Nine votes ahead of Tony Antrobus, but you copped a one-week suspension through the season. And your dad, Harry, defended you. How did you feel knowing that you've bolted in the McGarry Medal and yet you couldn't take the presentation because of that one-week suspension? It must have hurt a young player. Yeah, oh, look, I, I was all right, was he? The, um, I remember saying to Dad, he used to call himself Perry Mason because he used to love going to the tribunal and getting all the players off. I said, your son goes up for the first time, you can't get him off. And uh, I remember that night, I met a few of the boys early that night, we'd, we'd, we'd knocked out of the finals and um, I met McDermott and McGuinness, we were all going, we had a few beers at five o'clock in the city and uh, we had a good night, had a good night planned. And halfway through the count, I was a fair way ahead and the umpire was Laurie Argent, who umpired a few state games and that. And, uh, he came over at the end and said, look, we'll both have to live with this son. And I think, well, I seriously had to hold Dad down for knocking him out. He was that upset about it. But look, I was OK about it. I mean, not as though I sit back and worry about not winning the McGarry medal, but, you know, it would have been nice to win. It was an individual thing, but um, it hurt a lot of other people yeah. more than it hurt me, I think. Through the 80s, of course, uh, there was no AFL. It was VFL, and uh, the big footy was played in Victoria. Around about what stage did VFL teams start knocking on the door? The under 16s was Perth in, what was it 79 and 1980? It was two a cup in Perth as well the next year. And a few of the clubs came knocking on the door to Dad then. And so that's when Shane O'Sullivan first found me and uh, they made contact. And Carlton were the first club legitimately who rang and uh, made themselves known. And probably right from 16, you know, 15 or 16 onwards, a, a lot of the clubs would ring. And, you know, it wasn't like it is now. I, I, I was happy to say in South Australia, I didn't feel like leaving. 64, 30 minutes of football remaining in the 85 grand final. In 1985, it was your last year playing for Glenelg and uh, Glenelg won the Premiership, won it easily, had a really good season. Not only did they win the Premiership, you played at centre-half forward, you kicked seven goals, voted best of field. You were 22 years of age, which by today's standards is fairly old to be going into uh, VFL, AFL. Would you have stayed at Glenelg had they lost that grand final? Yeah, I can, I can probably say it now, I was going to go. I, I said to Dad during the years, geez, we want to win it this year, I really want to win it. Because I, I, I'd said to Carl, as my own excuse from uh, you know, 1980 to 1985, that I've got to, I'm not going to go until we win a flag. We'd had a, we lost a grand final in 83. Uh, got knocked out in the prelim the year before, and I thought it was never going to happen. I, I played 136 games before I came, uh, league footy in Adelaide. And you know, as you say, I was 22, it was pretty late. Uh, but not everyone came in those days, so I think I would have come anyway, Walsy. Um, but we won the flag and ended up you know, being a great finish. It was sort of like a fairy tale to live at the club you grew up at and play it. All your mates and your family and girlfriends and that, you, you know, had great times when you finally got one. So it was, a, it was a pretty good farewell to finally say, yeah, we're going to go. Talking about girlfriends, uh, your wife Jenny, she was your girlfriend back then. How did you break the news to her that you were leaving Adelaide? She was a bit flat. Because <laughs> I'd... Um, <laughs> As I said, those seven blokes you talk about, uh, we'd, we'd let her, you know, we didn't have many girlfriends in those early days, we, not steady ones anyway, and uh, I think we all decided we had to settle down a bit. In 84, when we lost that preliminary final, we thought, you know, we, we really, uh, we were enjoying ourselves a bit too much, we just steady down a bit. So a lot of us actually ended up getting girlfriends, that's when I met Jenny, late, late 84, and we went out together in 85, and, uh, you know, we won a flag, I thought, well, this is a good omen, but... Then I had to tell her, look, I'm going to go over there. I'm not sure how I'll go. I could be back in three months or at the end of the year. I'm not sure if I'll make it or not. That was serious the way, the way I thought. So she was a bit flat. I had my first two years over here on her own, and she eventually followed later on. I'll never forget coming into uh, the Carlton Football Club and being presented with Stephen Kernahan, Craig Bradley, Peter Motley, John Dorotich from Western Australia. Uh, the cream of footballers outside of Victoria at that time. 
Uh, so for me as a coach, it was just uh, wonderful to have an opportunity to be able to work with players like that. Now, Peter Motley and Craig Bradley, they came from different clubs in Adelaide. Craig came from Port Adelaide and Peter was from Sturt. Y you were great mates, so where did the connection begin back in the Adelaide days with those fellas? Well, back, look, I knew Brattles from those, even those early cricket days. Mots was always a year younger than us, so we didn't really meet him until later on. And uh, basically when he started playing state footy, we were playing state footy at 18 in Adelaide, and uh, that's when Mots came in as well, and Brattles and I and Johnny Platten and all these blokes, we grew up together in those state sides, and that's when we forged our relationships, and uh, yeah, great mates to this day. Did you know that they'd be coming over? Like, did you talk about it as a group of three all tied to Carlton? Did, did you talk about it through that 85 season that, hey, we're, we're heading to Carlton no matter what? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was nearly packed at the end. Originally, Johnny Platten and I were, um, Carlton had been to, on to us. They thought we were both coming there, coming to them. Brattles was with uh, Moore with Essen and uh, Motts was with Sydney. Now, for some way, Ian Collins and uh, John Elliott and that crew somehow ended up landing myself. Mott's and Brattles, and the Swans and Essen still were a bit flat with them for that. And Johnny Platten, I think, ended up obviously uh, severed ties with Carlton and going to Hawthorne. So we did ring each other all year. You're going to go. Is it time to go? And we said, well, let's just wait close to the end of the season. We'll let each other know. So we all decided basically at the end it's time to go. When you've arrived here, I thought you were really hard on yourself. You'd never rate yourself better than five, and often with three and four out of ten. I wouldn't take 12 marks a game, I feel disappointed, so that's why I marked myself hard, because I just needed, wanted to do better, I guess. Uh, strong mark, beat two. So when you've arrived here, you're 22 years of age, you've got a lot of experience from playing in Adelaide, but you're pretty skinny. Uh, David Glasgow looked at those yeah. skinny legs and said, they're not legs, they're sticks. How heavy were you and how hard did you work to build up the strength in the body? Well, you'd know, Wolsey, because you used to get... I hadn't, I hadn't copped a bake, I don't reckon, that late from a coach or anyone in my early days, but I copped a few from you. And a lot of them were about not being big enough and strong enough and uh, but, you know, being able to stand your ground and hold your marks. So I was 86 when I got here. Um, at the end of that year, I was 98, basically. I was 97, 98, and uh, you probably know, I lived in the gym and uh, worked. You know, I was the last bloke off the track, Brattles and I probably in those days, and uh, last bloke up in the gym, and uh, you know, I needed to do that. Standing blokes like Greg Phillips and Ross Glendinning and these sort of blokes, they were twice the size of me, and uh, it was a good learning curve for me, and you, you pushed me all the way, there's no doubt about that, and uh, obviously helped me future years. I can remember back to those days, uh, Stephen, the players had to fill in a book uh, after each match and amongst the things they had to do was give themselves a rating out of 10 on their own performance. Now as a coach I used to enjoy getting that sort of feedback. Now one of your teammates, Mill Hanna, who <laughs> played his first game with you in 86, yeah. Mill would consistently rate himself 8, 9 and 10 out of 10. There's Lebanese blacks who like that. <laughs> but in your own case, I thought you were really hard on yourself. Uh, you'd, you'd never rate yourself better than five, and often with three and four out of ten. As your coach, I would have thought that you were more around the seven or eight mark on those occasions. But to me, it was a great sign that you were not satisfied, that you were really setting high standards for yourself. When you came across, uh, was there a point in that first year where you said, hey, I, I reckon I can make a ten-year career of this? Well, look, I was nervous about coming, Wars. I mean, people probably don't understand it, eh? Um, I think uh, Stephen Stretch and Danny Hughes came over in 85, and the only people in South Australians that had come over before that were Rick Davies, Graham Corns, Russell Ebert, Kim Hodgman. They never went the distance, did yeah. they? It's not like they played 100 games. No, and it's hard. We didn't have any reference. And, and really, we watched you know, the winners on Sunday morning having a few beers. That was our link to VFL. We had our own league in South Australia, and we were all happy doing that. And... Uh, you know, I wasn't being modest saying to people, you know, I'm not sure how I'll go, will I make it? And, you know, what drove me, Dad came over, for, he came over the first game, they came over for a day, I think it was the fourth or fifth game of the year at, uh, it was at Waverley and a pouring, usually rained every day out there, wasn't it? And uh, I got dragged at half time, first time I'd even dragged in my life and didn't play the rest of the game. And I thought, geez, well, you know, my next, uh, you know, I'll be back in the twos. And, I, you know, I, I was unsure of myself, I didn't feel whether I, I'd made it or not. So um, the next week I went to Sydney, I think it was, and I, kicked five goals, five or something, had a reasonable day and I, I just thought it was a good way to bounce back and I sort of, you know, felt more at home after that actually putting a score on the board. I was a hard marker mainly because I, you know, you get used to it in South Australia, it was, a, it was a lesser league but it was still a good league and 
you know, I played centre half forward and ruck, and uh, you know, you could take 18, 20 marks a week back home, and I was used to doing that. Um, and coming to Melbourne, tougher league, better players, and um, you know, roaming out of forward pocket and centre half forward, taking seven or eight marks a game, well, you know, that was a big change for me, even though I knew, you know, you can't expect to walk in and, and do what you didn't see out of Australia, and I really had to. Uh, you know, it was a hard mark, and because of that, I, I had certain arms. You know, 12, if I didn't take 12 marks a game, I felt disappointed. So, you know, that, that's why I marked myself hard, because I just needed, wanted to do better, I guess. Your first year with Carlton, 1986, was the last year for a Carlton legend in Bruce Stool. Uh, I know you thought the world of Bruce. Uh, what are your thoughts on and memories of playing with Bruce in that one year? Oh, I was wrapped. He, he, and Brattles will tell you the same thing in Mott's. So uh, to play with Bruce Stool, to watch him all those years, and... You know, he rang me years before when Carlton were trying to get me and, you know, fancy Bruce Dool, the poor bugger, having to ring a kid in Adelaide he's never met before and say, come to Carlton. It was a funny phone call. There wasn't much talking going on because <laughs> yeah. Bruce didn't say much. But I was just wrapped to be with him, you know, up in the weight room with him out on the track. He didn't say a lot, but just to be with him and watch him play. And I tell you, I don't reckon he got beaten too many times that year. Hunter late on the scene. Too late. Kernahan well. That first year, Steve, uh, 86, Carlton played in the grand final, played against Hawthorne and got beaten to soundly. Um, I was coach, you were playing at centre-half forward and a uh, bit of memories because uh, obviously you get to a grand final, you want to win it. A lot happened in the next summer and you know, Bruce Dool retired, Rod Ashman retired and Mark McClure, who had been captain in 86, he also left the club. The match committee decided to make you captain. I know a lot of people outside thought, gee, that's a bit of a shock. He's only been there five minutes and he's been made captain of the club. History would go on to prove that it was a wonderful decision. How did you feel when we came to you as a match committee and said, you're captain? Yeah, what were you doing, was it? Had a, <laughs> had, a, had a no brainer there. I don't know. A few people had touted my name around and I, I, it didn't affect me. I thought, I'd, you know. That, that, that won't happen. So I just got on with life as usual. And um, I remember going, being called in the match committee room with you and Lofsey, and I uh, can't remember who else was in the room being asked. And I said, look, I'd better go away and think about this. I said, no, no, I said, you're the bloke. And I walked out of that room thinking, geez, they've just made me captain. I, I basically said yes to it. I, didn't, I, I was sort of a bit surreal that I didn't really take it on board totally. That you know, To be looking after senior players that have been here for 10 and 11 and 12 years, and I've been here for a year, you know, I hardly felt like I should be in charge of this group of players. You know, it was a bit humbling and uh, a bit scary, but uh, the other part of that was obviously I felt a bit uncertain because Martin McClure had been terrific for me. Him retiring or finishing and going, and uh, me taking over, I felt a bit funny as well. But um, in the end, uh, I think you and Lofsey were, said you just got to do it, and I was happy to do it in the end. We'll move on to 1987, your second year, you're captain of the club for the first time and uh, tragedy hits the football club. Peter Motley is badly injured in a car accident Thursday night going home from training and it was touch and go as to whether Peter would live. It really shook the place up. Peter never played football again. It must have saddened you so much when that happened. Yeah, it did. And I was in the coma basically anywhere between three and four weeks, I think. And I remember when he woke up... Um, uh, Soss, Steve Savani and myself were allowed to go in. We were the first sort of people to see him, apart from Brattles and the family. And uh, it was a shock to see him after three or four weeks. Uh, you know, he was obviously thin and thank God he was so fit and strong. Mm. Luckily he was to get through that. Not many people would have and the doctor said that. I remember his first year he played a lot across the half-back line. Played half-back in the grand final. And the next year he was just starting to blossom and we were giving him a bit of freedom to play as a ruck rover. Uh, your career and Craig's career here at Carlton, wonderful careers. There's no doubt that Peter would have enjoyed the same sort of a career but for that ac that accident. Absolutely. If, look, if Brattles played at 39, I mean, why, why would Peter Motley not been able to? He was as fit, he was bigger. Um, he could have been anything lots. And as you say, just starting to get in the midfield and uh, he would have blossomed into something special. And yeah, It's a tragedy and... Uh, Look, he's got his life, thank God. Uh, the, you know, a lot of times he wasn't going to get there mm. through that, but uh, at least he didn't play again, but at least he's still around. In 87, uh, there, there were still other obstacles. Uh, Desin didn't play for the rest of the season, and uh, big suspension, which was really tough because Bernie had come from Sydney, had a couple of years with Carlton, was an important part of the team. And uh, Bernie missed out on his dream of playing in that grand final. I coached 350 games. 
going into that grand final, I was really confident that the team would win. I would have bet my house on it because I just knew that there was an enormous resolve amongst the Carlton players for each other, and in particular for those three players who were not going to take the field. Yeah, look, look, obviously we knew about Motts and we knew about Desi, and the last straw was when Bernie got, got suspended for that game and missed the final. And there's no doubt that's a huge uh, issue in the lead up to the game, and you know you, you don't just go out and play for those blokes, but they're a big, uh, big part of it. And I think everyone in their after match interviews and speeches, and straight away up on the podium. When you and I were up there, I'm sure we were all talking about it, you know, the Desi and uh, Motts and uh, Bernie for missing it. And uh, look, I agree, I was confident that day too. Was it was stinking hot. I was a bit worried about the weather. I'm no good in the heat, and uh, but you know those blokes in the stands was an important part of it. I also remember that year, I, I would have thought that that Carlton team was as tough as any team that I've ever coached. Yeah. Tough mentally, but also tough physically because uh, you know the whip was cracked pretty hard through the season and I knew that the Carlton boys had, you know, with their training it was combat and the Hawks had nothing like that. Well, we never I've never trained harder than I did, 86, 87, we glossed over that but uh, we were ready, you're right, we are physically, you know, training was war out here and I learned so much from 86. Uh, I had a couple of reasonable finals in um, 86. Grand final, I got smashed, had a horrible day. And geez, it played on my mind for the whole year and I'm sure it did on everyone else. And apart from that, as I say, we're ready, combat ready, physical. And Wayne Johnson's opening with the grand final just showed us. You know, when I saw that, I said, geez, we're going to be hard to beat today. Fires a goal, brilliant play by the So, first year as captain and a premiership under your belt, fantastic. We'll skip ahead. Next year, 88, the team got uh, knocked off by Melbourne in the preliminary final. And I guess no one knew at the time, but Carlton wouldn't play finals for five years. Uh, we go into season 89. Uh, I'm starting to lose the, lose the plot as a coach. And I think we only have a couple of wins. We're halfway mark of the season, and I get sacked as coach. When did you hear that I got sacked as coach? I got, I got a call from Wes Lofts on the training floor. Obviously, it would have been Monday morning. He rang me and said they're going to do it. I, I was I was amazed. I was flat, flabbergasted, and that, I hadn't been involved in anything like that. And uh, we were very loyal to Wolsey, I think, especially all the young blokes. A couple of the older guys had their problems at the time. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Carlton, you know, win loss records, um, they, they didn't tolerate it. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, obviously, we lost to the Brisbane Bears that, uh, that day. And, Obviously they pushed a button, which um, you know I don't agree with any of that sort of stuff, and uh, but it was pretty shocking at the time, and we all felt it hard. Alex Jizalenko came in as coach, and he coached for the remainder of that season of '89, and he coached for 1990, and then Alex, who I think expected would go on, he got the chop as well, yeah. and David Parkin came back to the club and started a 10-year reign. That five-year period where Carlton didn't play in finals. Um, Fair bit of talent here, you would say, but also perhaps an ageing list to a certain degree. Tough years for you yeah, as captain, were. could because you, know, you saw you saw a couple of coaches come and go. Well, I remember you spoke after we won '87. We had a meeting here, probably the first first day of pre-season uh, for the '88 season. You said, you know, why couldn't we go on and be, uh, you know, win five in a row, three in a row? We did have a good list. We were a bit old. Uh, but I always feel like we underachieved in those years, you know, with, with you know, Bradley and Silvani and mm. myself and a few others. We were the new nucleus coming through to lead and we didn't, um, didn't play well. And I think our, you know, I felt bad because the leadership group I thought would have been enough to push us through and it didn't. Um, and I still go back. That primary final was stiff in 88 though, was I reckon we kicked against the wind about three quarters that day and it poured rain in the last quarter. Mm. And I reckon we we still half a chance to beat Hawthorne in the grand final. Um, but yeah, what 89, 90, and 91 and 92 were uh, you know tough years. We we had to nearly start again. In part two of Return to Sender, Stephen Kernahan talks of Carlton's long road back to premiership contention in the early to mid 90s. 93, we found ourselves in a position of you know making grand final. We'd probably say it wasn't a vintage year. It was probably a good year to get you know get a flag under your belt, but they smashed us. Plus, life after football as an influential man behind the scenes. David Parkin came back to the club, started that 10-year reign as coach, uh, 91, 92, uh, really struggled. 93, the team got into a grand final. Kernahan should have got it free, he's taken the mark in any case. 93, I reckon a lot of sides must have been struggling because I don't think, we, we always had a bit of trouble, we had good core group I reckon and we sort of fell away pretty quickly, a lot quicker than a few of the other sides with our bottom 10 players. So, and, um, 
I just thought 93, we found ourselves in a position to you know, make a grand final. We sort of came out of the blue, I thought, but 92 it started to come good. We, we just missed the eight in 92 and really had a chance late in the season and stuffed it up. In 93, we just, um, you know, I think all of us guys were anywhere, well, I'd turn 30, so I'd brattles. Um, and we thought, you know, we've got to, we've got to try and get going here. I'm looking at Essen side, so not putting them down. They had a couple of seasoned veterans, but a lot of young kids in that side, and, and both those two teams made the grand final, so... You'd probably say it wasn't a vintage year. It was probably a good year to get, you know, get a flag under your belt. But we won the first final at Essendon by four points, I think, under lights. And um, I'll never forget afterwards. I said to Ella, "Geez, we're looking good." And I said, "Well, they had four out that night. We had to play a lot better." And as it turned out, we uh, that was about right. They smashed us. Michael Long went berserk early on and, and got us away. And we were no good after that. Still going. Thirty metres out. Steve, uh, 1991, the Adelaide Crows come into the AFL. You're contracted to Carlton in 91 and in 92, but I've got no doubt that they were uh, giving you a few phone calls. Must have been a tough decision for you, or, or wasn't it? Like, uh, what sort of pressure was put on you to return home? There was a lot in 92 especially. I mean, um, well, Chris McDoon was captain of the club and Tony McGuinness had gone back from uh, the Bulldogs. And as I said, that, that my, two of my closest mates in life, and uh, you know, that, that, that kept coming over quite often. I remember in the pre-season at the end of that year, um, you know, when I was so during the season, I just didn't speak about contracts. I didn't, you know, even Carlton wanted to talk about, it. and I think a few Carlton people were getting worried because the side was going average. I had a couple of, I had an average patch personally in '91 at the start. Um, and the Crows had come in and there had been rumours, you know, that they're speaking to me all through 91 and then 92 my last year and, you know, it was just continual. It drove me mad and maybe I should have, you know, in hindsight probably, you know, at the end of the day I wasn't going anywhere really. But uh, I just left it open. Maybe I was hedging my bets or whatever and, uh, you know, the Crows had a really good crack at me. They offered me a lot of money. I, you know, could have gone home for a lot of money. Did uh, Jenny, your wife, was was she keen to go back? Yeah, look, Jen, Jen she just went with whatever I wanted to uh, Look, she, Jen can take a loo footy, she didn't get uh, too uh, fussed with that. I think she used to go to the footy to catch up with the girls and have a few uh, champagnes and watch the game, have a chat. That was more her go. But uh, so look, Jen would have gone home, no worries. Her family were in clearance out of Australia, and so were mine, and uh, that wouldn't have been a problem. But um, What about mum and dad? What were, what were their thoughts? I would imagine they would have liked to have seen, uh, seen yeah. their son back home. I'm sure they would have, but... Um, I think they knew what I was going to do. I think they knew me well enough. I just, you know, you have two loves in your life: at Glenelg in, in Adelaide and uh, and Carlton here. And and there was getting to '92. We were starting to come good, and I saw some light at the end of the tunnel. And I mean, not that it would have worried me. I, I was going to stay at the end of the day. But I did speak to the Crows. I did give them the, you know, they've been. You know, I knew a few of those people. Bob Hammond was basically in charge in those days. And Graham Corns. Graham Corns, who coached me at a premiership at Glenelg, and. You know, and the, my best mate, my best man at my wedding was uh, the captain of the club. So, you know, I felt I owed it to them to give them a hearing and a chat and didn't want to just, you know, piss them off and that. Um, but, you know, in the end, after copious amounts of Crown Lager and McDermott drive me mad coming over and, we, you know, do this and do that, uh, I said, no, I'm going to stay, which I was probably always going to do. It, did, it wasn't really a big decision. I just thought I owed it to listen to the Crows yeah. and I was out of contract. And I suppose the money was getting a bit, you know, I hadn't been on massive money as, you know, people probably think I would have been. Um, and the Crows' offer was, you know, for those days was pretty pretty substantial and, um, you know, but I was happy to stay and I'm glad I did. You worked all through your football career? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I was a chalky on the uh, Adelaide Stock Exchange when I left school and... Uh, Got my dealer's licence when I came to Melbourne and was a, a operator on the floor of the Melbourne Stock Exchange. So loved doing that, and uh, you know it's hard yards because coming to train at five o'clock, uh, you know you're buying and selling shares all day. Had to get your figures right, and I remember racing to training here. You know, four o'clock the floor finished. Have to get in the run to the car and get here for five o'clock, and I'd, I'd be on the phone. Not, didn't have mobiles in those early eighties days, uh, mid eighties days, and. Um, you know, getting numbers right and figures right was pretty pretty hairy stuff. And then going and training for three hours and one of your uh, torture sessions was pretty hard yards. But so you stayed with the Blues and 95 Premiership year. Um, but it was also a sad year for you. Your mum passed away early 95 and she'd been a wonderful support for you. Um, you dedicated the rest of your footy career to your mum? I suppose you do. Look, we're a very close family and uh, you know, mum had cancer for a couple of years and, you know, through 94 and, 
you know, late, late 93 and 94, we'd, we'd gone home about six times on sort of mercy dashes that she wasn't going to see the night through. So it got, uh, you know, she battled on. She was trying to get my 200th game was. The first game of uh, 1995 was my 200th game. And uh, she said she sort of set herself a goal. She actually made a goal to get to Christmas because we had a yeah. big family Christmas with our brothers in Port Augusta in South Australia. And uh, she set her next goal to get to that first game, but she went uh, in late February in 95, and I suppose, you know, subconsciously you, you dedicate your footy to her, but, you know, it's just, you, you miss your mum, and uh, a bit devastating for everybody, but thank God you got footy, that's why you, you love being around your footy club. This was, uh, I was happy when I was here, uh, a bit flat when, you know, when mum wasn't around. In 95, Carlton lost just the two games, and won the Premiership, quite easily as it turned out against Geelong well, and it, was a, it was a year in which from what you hear and read David Parkin empowered a senior group of, of 10 or 12 players was that the most successful season that you enjoyed as a, as a captain and, and as a player I saw it as a culmination Rob of um, you know 93 we lost the grand final 94 we finished second the home and away and I was you know Brattles and I and Soss and them were in our 30s and I thought, uh, we went out straight sets that year, and I thought, geez, he, he, you know, this is finished, and we got, we got really slandered in the press. Uh, too old, too slow, time for a clean out, and uh, you know, I think that was pretty personal, a lot of people. And, but I must admit, I only thought, well, geez, we've had a good crack of this last couple of years. Um, how are we going to get better? Because uh, really, our, our senior, our core group of senior players were still the, probably the difference between winning and losing, as they still are in every game of footy. And, uh, to go out and do what we did in 95, I mean, I'm not saying it came from nowhere, but uh, to be so dominant, um, I, I break uh, my shoulder or something, I missed those two losses. Mm. I remember coming back that next week and uh, there was a real turning point on the track. We got flogged those two games, uh, St Kilda and Sydney, and I, I came back, Greg Williams and I had missed a few games, and uh, we came back and we had a huge meeting on that Monday night, I called the players in, I'm not saying I, I, that I was involved in it, but I, we had a meeting and so we had to lift the tempo, you know, we've got something special here, this might be our last crack, and we went out and trained really, really well that night, because I was a big believer in training personally, uh, you, you know, train as you play yeah. and work hard, and, uh, you know, everyone got on board, and we went out and kicked, uh, I think, nine goals in the first quarter against Hawthorne, and beat Hawthorne, who was still a pretty good side, but 15, 16 goals that day, and we didn't look back after that, and, uh, you know, I just saw 95, you know, there was like a, a bunch of... Senior blokes who saw it as their last chance and uh, nothing was going to get in their way. A bit like Glenelg was to me in 85, my last chance to get one and this was much the same. But your first final was against uh, Brisbane Bears, my Brisbane Bears. And I was really proud of uh, Brisbane's performance that day because it was their first ever finals game. And I reckon they gave the Blues a genuine fright. Oh, well, they did. More than that. I thought, uh, seriously, I mentioned earlier, the 94 going out in straight sets, I was just more nervous before that first final than I was during the, before the preliminary and the uh, grand final, I reckon, because we, you know, the last three finals were played with losses. We'd won, what, uh, 13 in a row up until then, and everyone's saying we had to have a loss somewhere. We didn't play that great that day. The Duke boys probably played well and didn't allow us to, and uh, it was right in the balance right to the end, wasn't it? And uh, we probably needed, I think Cooter got up and going in the last quarter and kicked two or three yeah. going forward. And steady as a bit, new blokes still kept coming. And uh, was, there's a couple of things I remember about that day, apart from winning, which we're that relieved to. Uh, you walking off the ground and Roger Merritt taking that hanger at the end and kicking that yeah. goal. Yeah. Um, I think it was the first time Roger had got off the ground yeah, in about 10 years. He probably admitted that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, you were 34 years of age when you finished, and 1997 was your last year. Had you set yourself for that being your last season? Not, not at the start of the year. I thought, um, <coughs> well, at 96, um, I was OK. I was starting to get injuries. I did my first hammy in 96. I, I, used to, I used to think all these blokes were weak bastards when I did a hammy. Uh, I'd never pulled a muscle in my life, and it happened. One day I kicked four. I, I knew I had something on my hamstring. I did it the week before, but I didn't really worry about it. I just took a night off training. and Kicked a few goals in the first half out here. Went in at half time, they said you should come off, we were well in front. And I said, no, no, you, you think you just want to keep playing a kick a few. And uh, first minute I, I let out and took a mark and I just went bang. And, and that's when I started to get a few little, uh, you know, soft tissues. The first time I did it, I, I hurt that a little bit later in that year in 96. But you anyway, know, I, I played okay and uh, we got flogged in a final in Brisbane. And I, I think I kicked six in the first half in that final where we got smashed and... 
I thought, you know, still holding my own, I'll keep going. Uh, 97, had a pretty good pre-season, but I, I started getting this calf, this Achilles calf I had, and uh, and it's not making excuses. I, I didn't play that great footy. Uh, the worst thing that had me that year, Rob, was um, I'd, in the um, the first night game that year, I I tore the uh, tendon off the bone. I tackled a bloke late in the game in the night game, and uh, it cost me eight weeks. I think Matthew Lloyd did it a couple of years ago, and... You know, I just sort of strap it up, no worries, boys. At the end of the game, I couldn't move my finger, it was stuck. And on the Monday, I was in the operating theatre, and uh, here you're stuck like that with a brace on, and uh, you, you know, you tied, drill a hole through your finger. Now it's a pretty serious operation. And, you know, I missed those eight weeks, walked straight back in the side early in the season, and really didn't, didn't play, didn't feel myself, and trained too hard. And, had a bit of an injury, and I reckon halfway through, I'm thinking, shit, this isn't looking good. I've seen a lot of blokes, uh, you know, not performing, and as you say, you get used to performing at a certain level, and I knew I wasn't playing that well. Uh, Lance Whitman was coming in, and probably about halfway through, when I first did this calf, I did it properly in a game, this four weeks or three weeks. I thought, you know, this is uh, this is showing signs of near the end, and towards the end of the year, I think I was talking earlier about. Uh, I remember doing a warm up in my last game, and I thought that'll do it. Because uh, the Achilles, I spoke to the doc afterwards, he says, your Achilles, you know, it's not looking good. It was double the size of the other yeah. leg and, uh, you know, you're going to miss the pre-season, so that was time. How do you assess, John, and uh, no football after premierships with Glenelg, a couple of premierships with Carlton, captain for so many years, were you able to go back to, say, a normal life? Yeah, I was. Look, I, I was all right. I handled it pretty well. I don't think we made the announcement. Greg Williams retired as well. We were great mates and... Uh, we didn't make it until the uh, Carlton lunch in the day before the grand final. Obviously, I went away with the boys, I think, for a couple of weeks and uh, a week or so and on the drink and didn't want to worry about retirement talk or anything like mm. that, but I knew what I was doing. And uh, we didn't make it till then, so I was pretty relaxed. You know, we had a press conference at the lunch and Greg and I made our announcement and went and had a drink afterwards. And I think I, I was ready to finish. And one thing I'd, you want to get right is when you finish, you're done. Don't, don't keep going on and make a fuss. And, um, you know, I just walked along a good business uh, on the go, uh, Docklands Press, which we build up to something pretty good at the moment, and uh, just good to see the kids grow up and spend a bit of time with them and work. Did, did you have coaching aspirations? Were, were you uh, contacted by I was coach? touted to. Um, look, John Elliott, um, you know, he, he, we were pretty good friends, a president, captain relationship that grew. And he ended up putting me on the board, and I, I think John and Wes might have, if I had pushed it any further with them, um, if I'd had an opportunity to coach, so they'd probably give me a role, I think, maybe. Mm. Um, but I, I, I didn't want that. I, we had David Park in there, and, and obviously a bloke that you know pretty well, Wayne Britton, came in the club at that time when I'd finished in, in the late late nineties, and uh, he was a terrific operator, and I knew he was the good best, you know, he was the man for the job if he could ever get a role at the club. So, you know, I just back Park up, and I, I got, you know, they they gave me a role as assistant coach part time, and it was just great to have a. You know, help with the players. I feel like you're hanging around too long, but yeah. they were happy to have me there, I think, and uh, just, just help out the training. Because we had a, you know, a couple of young blokes, new young guys coming through. How do you assess John Elliott's contribution to the Carlton Football Club? Well, it's a, look, it's been well documented, hasn't it? He's, he's gone on hard times, and um, I, I did the forward to his book, which I copped a lot of flack for personally, and that, that was fine. And uh, Unfortunately, you can't be told by other people you know, who you should see and who you should support, and uh, John Elliott had been on to me since those early 80s day when Carlton were knocking on my door every day and he was very good to my mum and dad and my two brothers and myself and uh, you know what's that, that's 24 years ago. Yeah. We did a lot of good things for the club and people shouldn't uh, you know, shouldn't forget those things. Obviously the club's got in a bit of trouble because of a few decisions that he made and uh, that's fair enough and we, we'll have to live with them and, and deal with them. But uh, you know, look, I, I still speak to John, I still see him, he's, he's on tough times, but you know, just give people away. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll probably, one of my, um, I'll probably stay loyal to people, um, and I, I'll, I've been loyal to John because he was good to me. You, you were a strong part of the board when John Elliott was president, and then uh, John left, forced out in a way, by Ian Collins and his team, and now you're part of the Ian Collins board. Uh, difficult period in the early days, be going from one camp to the other? Yeah, it was. Oh, I copped a bit of, uh, you know, I don't enjoy being in the papers, and I seem to be, you know, I got caught up in being an Elliot supporter. I think people sort of, people that wanted to talk about it missed the idea that I was meant to be in the Ian Collins camp or the John Elliott camp. I was on a board with John Elliott, the Carlton Football Club at the time, and 
I think people missed the fact that I, I didn't support anyone. I was supporting the Carlton Footy Club, I think, but that got missed up in all of it. And uh, all I was interested in, my, for my part, the club was trying to get our draft picks in. The draft was coming up, we knew this, uh, uh, the salary cap infringement, you know, the breach at the time was going to come up, and uh, as it did, it came up against the Friday before that draft. And Colo had already been in by then, I was hoping maybe John was going to go anyway, Rob, and I, you know, I just supported him, you know, let's, let's fight as long as we can and hopefully get these kids in, and then we cop what we get. But obviously it didn't happen, and uh, the AFL will give it to us fair and square. Dennis Pagan is now uh, coaching Carlton. He's uh, into his third season. How have things changed here since Dennis walked through the f through the door for the first time? Yeah, we've changed a lot. We're unrecognisable. I would have thought uh, his first year was a tough year for probably him personally and and, and the footy club. We were in disarray. We'd finished uh, obviously bottom, and um, you know we we weren't going to get any uh, relief from. Um, uh, we had no new kids come in the club. We missed out on got Art and the Wills and a few top 20 picks the first year, and it wasn't going to get better the next year. So he had to uh, find out who was going to stay and who was going to keep going. And uh, we lost, I think, I think, after his first year, Wills, we lost about 1,500 games worth of experience. We ran a line through McKay, uh, Ratton, um, Manton. I'm probably missing a couple others as well. Um, lost a lot of experience, and I think Dennis just wanted to get, had to start again get a lot of young kids back into the group. I guess what Dennis was looking for, the 18 to 23 year olds, try and get a group of those. We, we couldn't go into the draft again because we missed our first, um, our first pick was in the 30, late 30s or early 40s. So we had to get a lot of blokes probably that had played a bit of footy and hadn't quite made it. And Dennis did his best by getting a group of those people in. Steve, I said to you uh, earlier, like for me to walk into the Carlton Football Club and just sort of witness the players, I'm so impressed. They are bright-eyed, they're enthusiastic, they come and say good day to you, and I would think it would be exciting to be around them because uh, you can't help but be impressed at how tight they are, even though you know they've been battered over the last few years. But you, there's no doubt there's a good feel here. There is. It's terrific. Every time we come down, it's like that, Rob. They enjoy each other's company. And uh, as I was saying before, Dennis has started that pack. We're back in the draft now. He's, uh, he's pulled this group together. He's given them a bit of... Um, you know, Dennis sort of, you know, is a powerful figure in footy and I think he's led them to believe in themselves and to get 10 wins last year, I think, speaks volumes for not only the coach but, it, but the players because I, I tell you, personally, I was a bit negative at the start of the year. I thought five or six might have been more like the point to win uh, 10. It was a pretty good effort from what we had and uh, the way you see those blokes, we, that's how much we've changed with the youngest group in the, the youngest list of the league at the moment, I think, if you go through it. Um, we're hungry, they're keen, really competitive. Um, we're starting to get a list together that'll compete for spots week to week. And instead of picking from 20, you know, 22 players a week, we should be able to. There's 30 odd players on our list that can get a game from week to week. So we, we're looking a bit more healthy. If it, if we can get a few wins on the board, I don't know how many. Uh, we're back in the draft. We're sort of not going downhill at the moment. We're on the slow, slow incline up. How long it'll be, we don't know. Tough one. Who's the best Carlton player you've seen? Yeah, geez, yeah. Um, you know, like a, a lot of the great players, when I got here, you know, some of the players we mentioned earlier were, were coming in. I won't. Johnston was in, in the big games and how hard he was at training on the track was, uh, was great to watch. Um, you know, Greg Williams, Craig Bradley, um, just terrific in the middle, different type of players, but, you know, great skills, great talent. And Stu Silvani, you know, what he did, you know, I, I go back to his 95 final series, I think he took, um, can't remember who he stood against Brisbane that day, Rob Burnett. Merritt. Merritt, yeah. probably did a good job on him and uh, fixed Kerry and Ablett up in those uh, Ablett, finals, yeah. you know, it was a pretty good final series and, and Soss was there, uh, you know, thank God I didn't have to stand him, he was a terrific player. Um, and Justin Madden, you know, I'd, if I'm late at night and there's nothing on TV or something, I've gone to a few tapes after a few beers and I, I just sit there and watch some of the stuff those blokes used to do out of the middle. It was just unbelievable what they did. He's the only bloke I coached, Justin Madden, who took absolutely no notice of what I said. Some no. players took little notice. Mm. He took absolutely no notice yeah. of what the coach said. Went on his merry way. He didn't did. really like footy that much. Yeah. Just went out and played. Like the money. Yeah. Uh, and I'm saying this a bit facetiously, Harry, but uh, <laughs> he was that type of bloke. Um, he, 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 the one thing he did, though, when he got across the line, he was full on. And uh, he was a good man to have, Harry. You know, 
we rode on his back for a fair while too. Best player you've ever had. You know, they're hard, aren't they? You know, it, it was great to watch. I love watching Kerry. I, you know, go back to centre forwards. Um, you know, I like watching them and the way Kerry dictated games. And when he was up and arrogant and strutting around, I reckon you know there's no better player to watch. And uh, the foodies, um, you know, whether this is best over a long time, probably probably not so much that, but more uh, during 2000, around 60, around 20, before he did his first knee. I, I reckon Cooter did things that I've never seen anyone else do. He did it in the air, on the ground. He was fantastic. Yeah. But you could, you know, you could keep going, couldn't you? Chris Langford, uh, you and Chris Langford had a great rivalry. Was he your toughest opponent? Absolutely, him and Djakovic. He was a nightmare. <laughs> so it was tough getting a kick. Langford was as tall as me and, and a lot quicker. Yeah. And he played a very good, uh, very good defence, Hawthorne especially in those. Yeah. He was tough to get a kick against and, and very much the same Djakovic. I got him probably you know, into my 30s for those last four or five years. I didn't need him. He was, he was fresh and keen and big and strong and uh, he was a great player. Steve, just to finish off with, uh, you played with a lot of great characters over the years. Just uh, a couple of quick thoughts. I'll throw the names at you. Just a couple of quick thoughts. Jimmy Buckley. Uh, interesting two years living at his house. We saw the mafia, the, the bookies, the SPs, everything go through that house. But great time. David Reese jones Good man, uh, Reese. He, um, I would have hated to play against him. He was a great player to have on your side and uh, had a lot of good, uh, good times with Reese. Fraser Brown. The dog, he's a good mate of mine, uh, all of our blokes, um, he's done very well in business and uh, he was a bit slow early in his career, Brownie, but he really uh, became a force. Greg Williams? Doesn't talk much, legitimately quiet like Bruce Dawes. What does he call you? Um, Kernahan? Yeah, he calls it, it. The players at this club when he came just couldn't get used to it. Brattle still can't believe he just goes, hey Bradley, Bradley, calls everyone by the last name. He's a good diesel, good bloke and a uh, very close mate of mine. Peter Dean? Yeah, go to, go to war with you, Danny. He, uh, I, don't, I don't reckon he's underrated. People might see him outside as underrated, but everyone at Carlton knew how important he was. He was a great player to have on your side. David Parkin? Yeah, great. Very loyal to him. He's a premiership coach like you were. And you go to your grave with those blokes, and uh, he had a great effect over me early before I even came to Carlton, and, uh, and obviously during it. Ian Collins. Collos, I've known Collos since I was a kid. Uh, he's been trying to get me over for years early on, and uh, now I'm on the board with him. And uh, love sitting with him. We've, we've fly now, we fly now, we together uh, on the way to game yeah. sometimes. I enjoy my time with Collos immensely. Up the front of the plane? Well, I think that's why I fly with him, was he? <laughs> I'd be up the back if I weren't the plane. <laughs> Steve, thanks for talking to us. It's just been an absolute delight to catch up. Um, you go into your 20th year with the Carlton Football Club, and uh, I'll tell you what, the Carlton Football Club should be very grateful. I know they are to have you as part of it. Thanks Appreciate it, Rob. Thanks, mate. Good to see you.